One, one of my boys said something that I don't even know if he realizes how deep that shit was. He said that, uh, shout, shout out to the Struggle News Network. He said, <laughs> we're the only ones who don't know it's a race. Like we call it, they call it race. It's a race. This is a competition. This is an international competition. And we're the only group who does what? not view it that way. Wait a minute. Say that one more time. That just, wait a minute. We call it a race. The Our brother race said, the brother said, we're the only ones who don't know it's a race. Yes. That just blew my head. Deion Sanders. Where do you want to start, Courtney? Okay, so okay, so before we got live, right? And uh -huh. all right, so we talked about Deion Sanders a few months ago mm. when he left Jackson State. And you asked me what my opinion, I told you I was mad. Mm. And then you got mad at me and then we were mad at each other. Yes. Yes. See what the people don't know is me and our friendship. Oh yeah, we be falling out all the time. We be falling out all the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. Yeah. Okay, so um, from your perspective, because I'll I'll articulate my perspective, but from your perspective, um, explain what it is that, or how it is that you saw Dion, and why the move was so off-putting to you. Okay, so, you know, I'm a, if you don't stop, okay. I am an advocate of HBCUs because I am a graduate of Tennessee State University. So uh, my, my HBCU, and I was so happy when Deion Sanders came to Jackson State because I said, finally, HBCUs can finally be on the map can finally be looked at as uh, relevant. And so I was so happy. Um, and then when he left, I was mad. Absolutely, <laughs> I was mad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then you got mad at me. But, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 fin fin finish your book, finish your book. I'm okay. gonna jump in after the book. Um, I understood your take. Um, and I think your take was pretty much how Jackson State treated him. And I also agree that Jackson State should have done the best they could do and put more effort in him staying. But, you know, now that he's in Colorado and seeing what he's been doing, I mean, I'm going to support him regardless. I was hurt. <laughs> However, this black man going in a white territory, killing it. I cannot not support him. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, um, you like that, don't you? You're like, look at her coming around. Okay, coming. You go. Yeah, you're gonna come around eventually. Um, so, the issue that I had. Uh, with our conversation. And you're right. I should have absolutely called you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. If call out, it'd be... It's via text. Message. Yeah. Message. Right. He don't mm -hmm. call the people. So th this is the issue that I had. So basically, um, you know, Deion Sanders went to Jackson State. Um, he stayed there, I believe, three years. I believe he was there three years. Um, yeah. Took him to the SWAC championship, um, took him to the Celebration Bowl. I actually went to the Celebration Bowl, uh, maybe not last year, but year before last um, in Atlanta. Um, yeah. I think that when Dion came, because he was coaching his sons ever since they were little, but when he decided he was going to try to you know, pursue it on a higher level, um, a lot of the critique was he didn't have any experience. Right? Mm -hmm. He didn't have any experience. You know, how is he going to get a coaching job? He doesn't have any experience. I assumed, <clears throat> I assumed that the majority of that critique was coming from uh, white people and white institutions, mm -hmm. right? because that makes sense, right? You, you're, you're supposed to think that the black man is intellectually or... Um, dispositionally incapable. You're supposed right. to think that, despite his 
qualifications or his achievements. You're supposed to think niggas ain't shit. I get that. <laughs> but when black folks started regurgitating some of that rhetoric as well, and specifically black folks at a Jackson State, mm -hmm. that's what started pissing me off because it was framed as Jackson State gave Deion Sanders an opportunity as opposed to Deion Sanders put Jackson State on the map. Okay. Right. And, and the, re the, the, the problem that I had with that is as black men, a lot of our, the chip that we have on our shoulder is that niggas ain't shit. Because it runs deeper than just like women saying niggas ain't shit. It's the world doesn't think niggas are shit. We, they think that we are intellectually inferior. Uh, we're not even able to uh, protect our women. We're not able to actualize any of our visions or whatever the case may be. So if anybody should believe in us, it should be us. Yes. Okay. Especially if we are in some way, shape, or form overqualified. Deion Sanders is a pro bowler. Deion Sanders is an all-star baseball. Nick could have coached baseball if he wanted to, Back. right? He, he, he's, he's a legend at, at Florida State. He's a legend in the NFL. He's got his, a gold jacket, the whole nine. But for whatever reason, he's still unqualified because that's our default with black men. Mm -hmm. So for me, when it got to the point where he had done all that he was doing for, the, uh, for, for Jackson State that he's now doing for Colorado. Um, but despite that, his son's cars were still getting broken into, despite mm -hmm. the fact that he brought three of his children to, mm -hmm. a, to a, a um, when it comes to facilities, yeah. a subpar school, just because he was overly invested in its success, but to still be upset with the brother, I'm like, man, what does a black man have to do? Right? It, it's kind of okay. like when, when uh, people were burning LeBron James' jersey when he left Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, like, yo, without LeBron, y'all wouldn't be shit. Like, thank you, LeBron. Yeah. That, that should be the energy. And I know, especially black men who found some success in their life, they have felt that sense of never being good enough. Never being good enough for a thank you. It's always, what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. And for us to project that same energy to um, our greats, our legends, people that if they died tomorrow would rock the foundation of the world, I think it's just, it's in poor taste. So it wasn't just you, but generally the conversation I was seeing around Dion, like this nigga sell out, this is, I'm like, you ungrateful bastards. <laughs> because if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't even know this school exists. And I understand, you know, being an HBCU alumni, it's hard to hear because it's like, you know, swack this and that. But let's be honest. Let's be real. Because that same energy, he's bringing that energy to Colorado now, and it's being reciprocated. Right? So we can continue, for example, to talk about okay. how, um, you know, men get some money or they become successful and they get a white Maybe woman. The, right. They right. Or, and get a white woman. Or we can, we can actually talk about the fact that when that man gets successful, he's a target in the hood. When that man gets successful, instead of young dog, <laughs> you know, we're, we're one of the only communities that, Oh, you think you look good. It's supposed to be a compliment. Mm hmm. Who do you think you are is supposed to mean that you are somebody like we don't even know how to see ourselves as great. We don't know how to celebrate the greatness in ourselves, let alone the people who've like statistically and objectively checked off the boxes. And unfortunately, it's not until these men go, even like we're talking about the passport bros, it's not until they take their talents to South Beach or Thailand or whatever the case may be that they actually get their flowers. And we can either keep shaming them or we can talk about it and make sure that the next NFL athlete, the next NFL great who looks at Morehouse or who looks at Tennessee State and says, you know what, I want to bring my resources, my know-how and this, this and that. He's not put off by the way that people are crucifying a man who did more than he was called to do in a way that was more beneficial to the institution than it was to him. He didn't make no money off of that. 
I agree with what you're saying. I I don't have pushback, <laughs> but I'm gonna add to it from a a different perspective, being okay. that you know, obviously, I am HBCU to to the death. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, affirmative action ending in these schools, Harvard and things like that. Um, I think me being proud of being an HBCU grad is because I'm invested in my community Mm -hmm. and I want it to be the best it can be for us, FUBU, for us, by us. And I was upset when Deion Sanders left because I just saw so much potential. Finally, HBCUs has, uh, we can now compete in sports or we have someone and our eyes are looking at us finally. We've been centuries for HBCUs and finally we have something. Now I was pissed off at Jackson State because again, they should have treated him like a king and they didn't. now, Deion Sanders coming to Jackson State, he should have he should have known that Mississippi is the poorest state in the United States. Mm-hmm. Mississippi is the dumbest state in the United States. They're not smart mm-hmm. and they broke. So mm-hmm. him going there, that should have kind of been like, okay, well, I know what I'm getting into. When you go to an HBCU, unfortunately, the facilities are not the best. They're not. It's 106, I believe, HBCUs, and they are struggling. A lot of them lost accreditation. Uh, Some of them just finally got it back. So when you're going to an HBCU, these are already what you should know. Him going to Mississippi, he's going to be around some dumb, broke folks Mm -hmm. with bad facilities. So because of that, for me, I'm just like, what did he expect going to Jackson? state those three things were assurance dumb broke and bad facilities but he decided to go there he signed a contract for five years he reneged on the contract he had a five-year contract for 1.5 million dollars um and he left within three years so he left out on the contract Mm -hmm. so he didn't stay the full time I would have left after year one, but that's okay. Me. Keep, going. Keep, going. Keep, going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. But again, Tennessee State University. Of course, you know, we got Eddie George. I love Eddie George. Mm-hmm. Okay. Heisman, Ohio State, Tennessee State, Tennessee Titan, you know, or Houston Oilers. My guy. Mm-hmm. Number 27. He is the head coach. He's been a head coach since April 2021. We treat him like he garbage. We do not. We Y'all treat him like good. A king. Okay. Okay. No, no, that's why he's still there. We mm. treat him like a king. And because of that, we, you know, a couple weeks ago, we went and played at Notre Dame, which is unheard of from HBCU playing in Notre Dame. Unheard of. I wanted that to be Jackson State legacy with Deion Sanders. And it wasn't. I blame Jackson State. Mm-hmm. But no, nah, I was sad that he left. I really, really I, was. I think um I think oftentimes because the masses never get to experience what it's like to like wear the crown or whatever, um, they assume that being the guy is the easy job. Mm -hmm. sometimes being the guy is the most difficult job you can have, Uh, particularly because you get all the blame and none of the credit, right? It it was was set up in a way where if they were successful, it was uh, because the HBCUs are successful. It gets spread out. But if they fail, it's because Deion Sanders, right? And to your point, I think if... Dion was treated like Eddie is being treated at, at your school. Um, he would have stayed the entire five years because think I think, so? I think when he came in, 
he, and again, I'm speculating, but I think he, he knew that Jackson was shit. He knew the facilities were trash. He knew mm-hmm. that, you know, the, 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 the players weren't up to par, whatever the case may be. And I think he sought that out intentionally to not just prove himself, but also set the example that we are not disposable as black people. We don't get to just turn a blind eye to the worst of ourselves, right? But it only works with a collective effort. There is no Jesus, there is no savior in our situation as black people, especially in the modern day. Like back in the day, it might've been a Martin or, or Malcolm the whole night, but now it absolutely relies on the collective effort, especially now that everybody thinks they're Malcolm and everybody thinks they're Martin. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think over years of experiencing not just the disrespect, but the obstacles and also the minimizing of his impact I would have left after a year, me being honest. Why? And let me make because um, because okay. I believe in covenants, right? You uphold your end of the bargain, I'll uphold mine. Jackson clearly did not. At different levels, Jackson clearly did not, and Dion clearly went above and beyond what he was contracted to do. So with that being the case, yo, after a while, like, if you're just doing business that way or anything that way, you're going to drain yourself and you're going to end up being jaded. And I don't want to be somebody, a leader, whatever the case may be, who ends up jaded. So I think the best thing he did was leave. I would have left sooner, but I'm not as great as Deion Sanders. Let me say this because, you know, I have to, sometimes you have to be a little bit more clear for the people, okay? Yeah. I did not say that Deion Sanders should take disrespect, okay? I didn't say that at all. What I said is that when you go to a HBCU, you can expect things not to be like a PWI. Mm -hmm. Meaning financial aid is always, you gonna get messed up on financial aid. That's just HBCU. Mm -hmm. Um, Facilities is not the best at HBCU. So these, when you go into these black colleges, this, this is already what you know what's going to happen or what you're going to see Mm -hmm. um i don't know about him leaving within a year i think uh eddie george was on uh shannon sharp's uh podcast and eddie was like you know when i went to tsu you know the facilities was needed some work and i knew going to tennessee state that it's going to be um some hurdles that I'm going to have to go through. And I know this already before I took the head position as the head football coach. So he already knew. Mm-hmm. The thing is that he had a- alumni um, in the city had his back, which mm-hmm. I just don't, I don't think Jackson State did. I think on top of that, um, okay, let, let's, let's, Compare and contrast. Number one, Edgy George was a great player. He wasn't Deion Sanders. Don't, don't you, don't. No, 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 Listen, then listen. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Eddie George. I was an offensive player. I was an offensive player back in the day. So I'm not even supposed to like put Dion. But Eddie, Eddie George ain't. You know what I'm saying? Like Eddie. Eddie George, like you could put Dion in some people's top five. Eddie George ain't there. Let's just Don't be real. That. Number, that's that's number one. Number two, number two, um, like you said, what Eddie was greeted with at TSU versus what Dion was greeted with at Jackson State. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's not yeah. the same, right? I, right? Yeah. So so he had a better team, right? Um, number three, Dion is coming with three children one of which is a Heisman candidate. Eddie George yeah. coming by himself. Eddie so, George so, has son playing, don't do that. Who's his son? That's Eddie the point. Son. He's That's playing. The- <laughs> <laughs> Eddie George Jr., I haven't seen him on nobody's list, but the point I'm making is like, it was, it was a lot, it was a lot more at stake uh, for D. I wish Dion would have went to Tennessee State. 
I wish Dion would have went to Tennessee State. Okay, so here's the thing too, because because of this whole debacle, right? And then it just made HBCUs look like we're just horrible. And it's just, mm-hmm. why would anyone want to go to an HBCU now? And it, and it just, we struggle so much. And because of this, and because it wasn't kept in home, we put it on the, the world to see. Again, talking shit about our culture. HBCUs is our culture. So we put it out here for the whole world to look at HBCUs as if it's not worthy enough to go to and HBCUs is so bad. No, that's Jackson mm-hmm. State. But come on over here to TSU. Go to but, uh, FAMU. Go to North Carolina A&T. It ain't and, the same and, experience. And, 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 I think, and I think that's where HBCUs drop the ball, right? Okay. Because I think the mistake we make as black people sometimes is when we think about keeping it in-house, we typically think about sweeping shit under the rug. Mm. If HBCUs had come out and said, this is unacceptable, Mm -hmm. Jackson State is not operating to an HBCU level, Mm -hmm. that would have been able to separate HBCU's level of excellence to what Jackson State is doing. Reprimand Jackson State, checks and balances within our institutions. The problem is, What we tend to do is, instead of being able to call out the bullshit that we do, we try to sweep it under the rug and then vilify the person who was actually affected by our bullshit. So even, even, you know, let's say uh, JSU, they did exactly what they did. But the other HBCUs, Morehouse, Howard, said that this is unacceptable. Deion Sanders, we would never treat you like this. Deion Sanders, we appreciate what you've done for not just Jackson, but HBCUs as a whole. When Ray Lewis thinks about becoming a coach, he now can separate JSU from HBCUs. But the fact that HBCU stood in solidarity in the critique of Deion Sanders being a sellout, that is what's going to run off potential. <laughs> Absolutely. You think we, you think HBCU Absolutely. is solidarity? I think, well, maybe Absolutely. silence was condoning it. No, y'all, my fuckers weren't silent. Y'all motherfuckers well, were no, I mean, Jackson was very up in arms, but you didn't hear more how film. But, you didn't hear, uh, but, but, I, but I heard, I heard, I heard people like yourself calling him a sellout generally because you took it as, you took it as he I broke up with. I called him a sellout, did I? No, I don't, I don't think I called him a sellout. Did I? No, I didn't. Pull, pull receipts. I got him. I know you but do. but but you took you took it as um, he he let down HBCUs, <laughs> right? You took it as he let down HBCUs. This is a this is an L for HBCUs. How dare? Because even at, at one point I said nobody knew who, who the hell Jackson State was. You took it as well. That means nobody knew who the hell Tennessee State was. And I wasn't saying that, but you you were like you know. Uh, uh, HBCUs are a small network and you know this and that so it was HBCU pride versus Deion Sanders at that point which I think hurts HBCUs and similarly I think a perfect example of that or a good way to juxtapose it is like part of the reason why so many men in, in, on the internet gravitate towards um, the female creators who are calling women out Mm-hmm. is because we never see that happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Women are usually standing in solidarity with women's bullshit. Like women aren't making the distinction between this is a standard of excellence that women should operate by and she did not follow that standard of excellence. Typically, it's excuses and it's like, well, she was this, that is it. And that's why like they gravitate. so Because it's like, oh, she's telling the truth. Or similarly, you know, people like... Um, Derrick Jackson and some of the panderers, mm-hmm. that's why women gravitate to them because they're like differentiating themselves. So similarly, I think we need to be able to check ourselves internally. And that doesn't mean we don't act like bullshit doesn't happen. It means yeah. that we have the intelligence and we have the honesty to call it out without it being personal. Yes. So I agree. Now, so, like, like you said, though, mm-hmm. the, the, the women and the Derrick Jackson and 
they you finally but the thing is that they don't even hold up to their standard facts none of them do facts not a mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so now facts. it's just validation it's just people wanting to get validated by the opposite mm-hmm. sex facts and hbcus um Deion Sanders was their validation. And once right. he left, they have no validation anymore. And so it, it was an L. Right. And they were pissed. I was and mad. that that that's that's why we have to put the ownership on our institutions. We we cannot expect one man to uh, sacrifice himself for the greater good. That's not sustainable. And I think that's, that's been our issue as a black community. We've been reliant on one man sacrificing himself, whether it was Ma- uh, Martin, Malcolm, Marcus Garvey, uh, Noble Drew Ali. We've been so reliant on people sacrificing. And it, again, the only way it works is if people are shielded by our institutions. Okay. Right. When, when, when that brother who's, who's got the gift of gab and he's going to speak truth to power, Who's going to pay his living expenses? Mm -hmm. Who's going to protect, like the nation of Islam, that's the only reason (laughs) Farrakhan is still alive. Who's going to protect him? But again, we talk so much about the lack of leadership without addressing the fact that we don't have the mechanisms in place to support or protect said leadership or incentivize said leadership. We want this Jesus figure who gains nothing and is just doing it out of the kindness of his heart and it's not going to work well any change it has to be sacrifice talking about a jesus figure well speaking Mm -hmm. of jesus he sacrificed Mm -hmm. his whole life to save the world it is sacrifice in order to change in order for this our community to be better Mm -hmm. you have to sacrifice something going to an hbcu Yes, it was a financial huge sacrifice for Deion Sanders. Yeah. And I think a lot of us was like, but we need you. Mm-hmm. We need we need HBCU. Mm-hmm. So in order for things to change, you have to sacrifice. In order to but, make relationships work, in order to make marriages work, it's a sacrifice. But there, see, that's the thing. And I and I think that's that's the reason I wanted to have this conversation because I think there's so much overlap with this and relationships sure. like black men and mm-hmm. black women. Yeah. Because I think sacrifice is a consequence. It's not an incentive. Right. If if you're yeah. if you're selling anything, you're not gonna come with. I'm I'm selling a Mercedes. I'm not gonna talk about the the uh, high insurance or the high cost of repair. No, I'm gonna talk about the zero to sixty. I'm gonna talk about the curb appeal and the whole nine. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, I think as a community, we have, <laughs> man, we have kind of been expected to eat chitlins and enjoy it, right? Like sacrifice, <laughs> sacrifice is not just expected for us, but we we are encouraged to celebrate it, mm-hmm. and then wonder why as we're going into subsequent generations. Dudes ain't trying to sacrifice no more. Because, again, it's not sustainable. The only thing that's sustainable is quid pro quo. You do this for me, I do this for you. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. Part of the reason why some of these men are going overseas, part of the reason why my brother's 19 years old, part of the reason why there's a good chance that he might not end up with a uh, a black woman, even though I'm his brother, Mm -hmm. is because... You can only talk that, you know, community shit for so, for so long. But when he compares his experience to, with black girls to white girls, black girls represent sacrifice. And white girls, despite whatever sacrifice they might represent, okay. despite whatever uh, sacrifice they might represent, there is at, at least some identifiable benefit. But unfortunately, I think as a community, we're not spending enough time bolstering the identifiable benefits Mm -hmm. we're just like demonizing and shaming people for not wanting to be a part of sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice okay you said sacrifice you think it is a consequence 
It's a consequence, yeah, not an incentive. I think that sacrifice is needed for change. So it's a mm -hmm. process, it's a part of it. So mm -hmm. losing weight, I have to sacrifice giving up my pizza and for mm -hmm. a, as a sacrifice. Yep. But that sacrifice has an end goal, and the end goal is what I'm looking forward to. Mm -hmm. So you have, I don't. And and don't, the, that, it, but see, it, even in that example, the end goal not only is the end goal worth the sacrifice, it is greater than the sacrifice. Yes. In a lot of these situations, kind of like the the Deion Sanders uh, situation, the end goal is not equivalent to the sacrifice. So with Deion Sanders sacrificing a lot to be at Jackson State, the end goal is for HBCUs and our black community in its totality to be better. So but HBCUs. See, that's, but that's okay. a benefit to HBCUs. That's not a benefit to Deion Sanders. So my, my point okay. is, my, my point is this. We can either continue to appeal to people's higher self or we can appeal to people's sensibilities. And our first rule, before we even learn about the Ten Commandments, as humans, mm -hmm. is self-preservation. So okay. if we want to create institutions that are sustainable, we must be able to intertwine and articulate the incentives with self-preservation. So even though it, it, this job is going to be hard, yeah, you know, you, you might... Uh, you might miss out on this that you could get here, but here are the here are the benefits. Here okay. here are the benefits that are clear that are equivalent at 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 least, mm -hmm. or definitely greater, right? Like right now, I've I've, I've probably got to spend the next six months getting a whole bunch of certifications to become a project manager. Mm -hmm. But when I become a project manager, I could be making multiple six figures. So despite the sacrifice, there is a clear benefit. Like, am I helping my company? Sure. But I'm getting paid. <laughs> I'm getting paid. Okay. I, I got you. There's, there's got to be a clear line because, again, and this is, this, you might not like this, but this is why I hate the be more like Jesus trope. Because Jesus was God. I'm a human. Okay. So, so this, this idea that humans in mass should be sustainably self-sacrificial, you know what that tends to lead to? Bitter people. Mm -hmm. Because when you get on the other side, even like on a small scale with relationships, you're sacrifice, sacrificing, and then eventually you're like, what the fuck did I do all this for? You're going to be a bitter ass, resentful ass person. So instead of us seeking out Jesus in human beings, I think we need to be clear about this is the cost but this is the yeah. benefit and the benefit will happen if the cost is paid simple whether it's for men whether it's for women so if you if you put in all this work to eat right and exercise the result is you're going to be sexy you're going to be able to attract better quality people you're going to be able to do this do that uh, uh live better live longer and yeah. i think as a community in general not just with hbcus but as a community in general we have a great deal of entitlement mm -hmm with each other's sacrifice. Yeah. As opposed to being able to clearly articulate, here's the bigger picture and here's how it'll benefit you. Whether it's you specifically, your legacy, whatever the case may be. So I I, I, I get your point. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Dion, him sacrificing a lot to be at Jackson State, uh, the benefit for him there wasn't necessarily because of what he had to sacrifice that wasn't beneficiary to him. So I get mm -hmm. that. In order to make our community better. Yeah. And the sacrifices that some of us have to make as far as volunteering, mentoring, giving back. What would be the incentive if it's not just necessarily because it's not necessary if i'm doing well then what would be an incentive to sacrifice anything for the community i think number one um have you ever heard the the saying if if poor people get hungry enough they'll eat the rich i heard that yeah so you know <laughs> part of the reason why i think 
men in particular should be concerned about the community is because um, you can raise your kids as good as you want to raise them. Right. But if the neighbor raises, excellent example, um, your neighbor not mowing his lawn can reduce your property value. Going through that now. Right. So this right. this individualistic ideal that we have as a community, your neighbor not raising his kid right could fuck up your kid. Mm -hmm. That could be the kid that molests your daughter. Mm -hmm. That could be the kid that introduces your son to, to, to crack. So so part of the reason why I think men in particular should be community focused and this and that is not just an altruistic. What would Jesus do thing? But it's also very practical. I don't want to I don't want you to fuck up my property value by your bad decision making. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think I think um, maybe I'll do a case study about this, but I think altruism is a lie. I think mm. people doing good for goodness sake is a lie. Really? I think absolutely. Because I think that even if your incentive is to go to heaven, you're doing it for a reason. So instead of us just relying on fairy tale reasons or, you know, it's the right thing to do. I want it to be practical. I'm doing this because of this. And it, there could be some goodness to it. It makes me feel good as well. But like, let's be clear on the benefit on both sides so we mm -hmm. can sustain this thing that you're doing. Or the, uh, or, and, and we can also inspire other people, right? So with um, Dr. King, it wasn't that, <laughs> it wasn't that the Edmund Pettus Bridge situation pulled at the heartstrings of white folks and made white women cry when they were watching mm -hmm. it. No, it was that it made America look bad internationally. Yeah. Y'all are these crusaders of peace. Y'all are the Superman of the world. But this is what you're doing to black folks in mm -hmm. your own country? Mm -hmm. Fuck all that. So again, instead of us spending all this kumbaya time and, and like time focused on appealing to people's hearts, no, we got to appeal to people's sensibilities and spend more time articulating, clarifying, and also cultivating clear win-win situations, whether it's with Dion and Jackson, whether it's with black men and black women, whether it's with a relationship. This is what I will do for you. This is what I expect you to do for me. Is this fair? No, it's not. I want more of this, or you don't have to do that, and then we can negotiate. But just I'm a good woman just because I'm a good woman. I'm a good man just because I'm a good man. It's not sustainable. Okay. I'm just, like my my big thing is like we give we give ourselves too much credit. People are not as moral as we think. People mm -hmm. are not as good as we think. I also don't think people are as bad as we think. Um, but I think what's sustainable, whether we're talking about repairing the black community or whatever the case may be. We have to be on the same page um, practically mm -hmm. because just blackness is not going to unite us. You see the FBA, non-FBA, you see Africa and all that stuff. That's not, there has to be a clear, this is how it's going to benefit us as a collective. And I, I want us to start spending more time having those conversations instead of just my brother this, my brother that. Yeah. Because when shit flips, you the ops now. Because these white folks that are working together, the Berlin Conference is a perfect example of that. They started working together after killing each other. But they got to the realization that, oh no, we can actually make more money together, working together, than we can just fighting over which African country to rape. But as, as Africans, as black folks, we think, oh, I gotta like you. Yeah. Oh, I got, we, we got to be, we got to have had, uh, grew up together, you know, sandbox and shit like that. And it's like, yo, that's not sustainable. It's not. It's mm -hmm. not going to work in the long run. And for us to teach our children that they should only do good for goodness sake, that's nice. But when, when good becomes blurry, yeah. they need to have a mechanism to be able to make clear and concise decisions that are not just beneficial to other people, but beneficial to themselves. Mm. So, <clears throat> going back to Deion Sanders. Let's talk about it. 
and so at Colorado. So he's getting a, still a lot of heat there. Um, still from black folks and some white people too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Now the white people is saying stuff about him. Is it because it's still the black man and his audacity to <laughs> be prime time? One, one of my boys says something that I don't even know if he realizes how deep that shit was. He said that, uh, shout, shout out to Struggle News Network. He said, <laughs> we're the only ones who don't know it's a race. Like we call it, they, they call it race. It's a race. This is a competition. This is an international competition. And we're the only group who does what? not view it that way. Wait a minute. Say that one more time. That just, shh, wait a minute. We call, the it's brother, a race. The Our brother race said, the brother said, we're the only ones who don't know it's a race. Yes. That just blew my head. Yeah, I mean, um, um, what's her name? I can't think of her name. Um, but she, she talked about it a lot where, um, damn, it's going to bother me. Hold on. Let me, I got let, me the, I gotta, let me put that in my notes. Yeah. No, the, 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 the brother blew, blew my mind with that one. That is deep. Mm -hmm. Dr. Frances Cress Welsing, you hey, know, she talked about, she talked about how, um, Caucasian genetics are inferior. Mm -hmm. Just genetically speaking, they're inferior. And the number one threat to Caucasian genetics are black genetics. Mm -hmm. Our genes are dominant. There's a recessive. That's not yes. to say black people are better than white people. That's just to say, if you add some black to white, the white no longer exists after a while. Mm -hmm. And it's not a conscious fear that white people have, but it's an unconscious. I think it's, con they know. I don't, I don't think it's conscious. I think it's an unconscious um, anxiety, right? Just like they've been scared that at some point black people are going to rise up and pay them back for all the... That's why they were scared of the Panthers. That's why they were scared mm -hmm. of the Nation of Islam and the whole nine. White people are a global minority. Mm -hmm. They're the majority in America, partly because they pad their stats with like Egyptians and shit like that. They call them white. But <laughs> globally, they're the minority. So that creates a deep insecurity mm -hmm. and guess guess who usually has uh some of the deepest insecurity the best fighters one of the most insecure people in the world is mike tyson that's why mm -hmm. you should knock everybody out because the nigga was scared white people are scared mm -hmm. now the problem is we as black folks <laughs> we think that we can appeal to their feelings Mm -hmm. And we forget that we cannot appeal to their sensibilities. Their sensibility is to survive. Yeah. The threat to that survival is me. So whether it's on the football field, whether it's, you know, genetically me sleeping with their daughter, whatever the case may be, they're afraid of their annihilation. Mm -hmm. And I think that the quicker black folks can wrap our heads around that, a lot of this stuff won't surprise us. Right. Like they had to at some point when uh, the, the leagues got integrated. They had to realize that, hey, black folks are the superior athletes. But guess what? We're still going to coach the motherfuckers. Now yeah. what they got? Now what they got? And now they got to pick at, oh, he got, he got glasses on. He's dancing. And this is that. They ain't got nothing else. So instead of us wondering why are white folks, why, why, why do white folks not like Dion? No, we need to protect Dion because they're yeah. not supposed to. They need Lane Kiffin. They need uh, the Alabama coach, whatever his name is. They need them. Because if, if, if after the coaching jobs go, then, well, black dudes are going to start owning these teams? I was going to say that. Um, again, where I'm kind of, you know, again, I'm mad about Jackson State. However, I support Deion Sanders because now in this um, – new venture that he's doing in Colorado. Like I said, last year they was uh one and eleven and now they three and oh. Three and oh. Yeah. Um I don't care if that brother don't win another game, man. Salute. He's a legend. 
and we need to give him all his flowers. Yeah. Because for me, and, and you know, when I was reading about um, Frederick Douglass, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of us know that Frederick Douglass was a prolific speaker and the whole nine. But actually, his biggest impact were the pictures that he took. Frederick Douglass is one of the first black men who took pictures like a white man. He looked directly in the camera. He was dressed to the nines. He was regal. Mm -hmm. He had his shoulders back, his head up. And that symbolism alone empowered and galvanized so many black folks. So for me, I think the, the outside of just, you know, black excellence being a whole bunch of niggas wearing suits, the symbol of black male audacity like, I'm going to do what I'm trying to do and nobody's going to stop me. I think that is the most powerful tool that we have. And unfortunately, this is where the women come in. <laughs> what do we do? Our women have been socialized with the reflex to minimize that audacity. Mm-hmm. Like I said earlier, oh, you think you look good. Mm-hmm. Oh, 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 who you think you are. That where comes you think you a lot. Where you think you <laughs> That comes from our women. So... There are a lot of potential Deion Sanders that never got the opportunity to even have the audacity to dream that big. Mm -hmm. Because the first place they're supposed to get audacity from after their father is their mother. Their father going to give them the genetics, but their mother going to give them, baby, you can be whatever the hell you want to be. But unfortunately, and um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Dr. Joy Dugri, she, she thinks that it's linked to the plantation with you know, black mothers not wanting their sons to stand out so they get sold off. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have taken it into the 21st century. Mm-hmm. But uh, we need to start thinking about how we are creating or potentially stifling other Deion Sanders because it's bigger than just him. Yeah. And I think the better that we protect him and the better that we celebrate him, the more we're incentivizing other potential Deion Sanders, whether it's with uh, potential coaches, you know, the next few years, or just in the distant future, boys to be like, oh, no, I'm going to win all these awards. I'm going to do all these great things. But just like the Sankofa bird, I'm going to look back. I'm going to find me a Jackson and see what I could do there. I'm going to find me a Tennessee State and see what I can do there. But if we forget Deion for a second, if Mm -hmm. we drop the ball that is Deion Sanders, there will be no other Deion Sanders. So this responsibility is on us. I agree. And I think it's um, the it's very powerful right now with Deion Sanders because he is a head coach. And so if he is successful, what does that mean for other huge um, colleges? Not even just looking at HBCUs, which, of course, you know, I'm going to support. Mm-hmm. But even, you know, the Notre Dames and those, you know, the Florida states. What would it look like if they start looking at head coaches and black men start getting those positions because you know that we don't? So I'm in agreement with you. Again, I support him. My feelings was hurt. I then moved on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm like, I want him to do well because now he's a coach. And if he does good, then that makes it an opportunity for other schools to get black head coaches. And then we're not just players. Mm-hmm. Now we're yep. running some shit. You know what I'm saying? And Facts. that's what I really want us to start looking at. Just fuck this. Just you want to be a player. You want to be a coach. You want to mm-hmm. own this shit. Right. That's why I was so big and I love um, Ice Cube and his big three. I wish that we supported that more. Mm-hmm. Start, you know, getting our talent in black owned places again. That's why I was hurt about HBCUs, you know. But however. Yeah. So I get it. You I'll, know. I'll, I'll, I'll say this too. I think um, <laughs> I think black business, um, you know, supports itself with black dollars. Mm-hmm. I think black enterprise supports itself with white dollars too. Like the the goal yeah. should be making money from them. And for every, too. well, making money. Period. Right. Right. We, we we shouldn't just relegate ourselves to. The was it 1.5 trillion that the, the, the yeah. or 15 trillion or something that the that the that's the black dollar. Mm-hmm. So, in these moments when those feelings want to kick in and be like, this nigga didn't stay the whole five years, we oh. need to be able to zoom out, <laughs> see the bigger picture, and understand that yo, Deion Sanders, and and that that's where I'm at. If if 
God forbid this man couldn't coach another day in football. Mm-hmm. He needs a BET award, NCAA, NAACP award, NCAA award. The man is good. Yeah. And as black folks, we need to be able to celebrate our greatness outside of the purview of white folks. Because unfortunately, what tends to happen, because we, we, we are so terrible at identifying and celebrating our greatness, mm-hmm. we also only validate ourselves by white acknowledgement of our greatness. I'm not a real artist until I win a Grammy. Right. I'm not a real uh, actor until I win an Oscar. Yeah. But because we haven't built up our institutions, because we are so down, uh, uh, dug in on critiquing ourselves, and we don't know how to acknowledge our greatness, we don't, like white folks can make a, a, just a white canvas and they can explain all the nuances and be like, the artist was this, and we're going to sell that for $20,000. Mm-hmm. But black folks, you got to paint the moon, the sky, heaven, mm-hmm. and, and, this, and it's still like, well, my homeboy down the street, he could paint it better, faster. Yeah. Like we are so accustomed, and we might call it the dozens, all kinds of shit. We're so accustomed to minimizing ourselves. Mm. And then later down the line, wonder why black men or black women or black kids have such an affinity for, for communities outside ourselves. Because that's the first time they can let their hair down. And mm-hmm. that's our fault. That's not theirs. Yeah. So did you see what Charleston White was saying about Deion Sanders? Yeah. Charleston White isn't serious. Charleston White, <laughs> Charleston White is a shock jock. Um, so he, he says things, and I think, again, he's an indictment on the larger social media space because if mm-hmm. he wasn't saying all this crazy stuff, he wouldn't have a platform. Okay. I believe, after hearing some of his actual, like, serious points, I think that he's doing it for a greater purpose. Which and he does a lot of um, community work. Right. Okay. He speaks at prisons. He does work with kids and things mm-hmm. like that. So he uses the fame to fund that. Um, at least that's what he's saying. I don't know mm-hmm. him personally. But if that's the case, it gives. But again, I think it still goes back to why do I have to post the worst part or the most inflammatory part of my two hour conversation for y'all to come over here and watch it? Right. 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 Because we can keep blaming me. Right. Or Charleston White. Or we can audit and think as a community, why is it that we don't support our intellectuals for being intellectuals? Mm -hmm. Like he talks about all the time where like when he was marching and he when he was outside uh, the house of of, of a police officer who just shot a kid, nobody was around him. Yeah. But now when he's saying, yeah, I I, I rate white women and all this bullshit. Now he's got a hundred and something thousand subscribers and followers and this, this and that and making money enough from speaking engagements to fund what he's doing. So if that's the case, God bless the brother. Mm -hmm. Um, And we can't be so emotional that we allow what shit looks like to distract from what shit is. But at the same time, we need to get to a point where our intellectuals don't have to um, cosplay as <laughs> as wait, wait, are uh, you Uncle calling, Ruckus's. Are you calling Charleston White an intellectual? I think that again, if what he when he's been sober minded and talking, because there are some interviews where he's not bull, he's not on the bullshit. He's just talking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If that's true, then yes. Hmm. Um, if it's not true and he's just trying to explain away the bullshit, then he's a fool and he's an idiot. But again, if it's true and he's just, you know, kind of like um, Kevin Samuels, average at best, all that stuff. If the internet didn't reward that type of behavior, I don't know if Kevin Samuels would have been doing that. But yeah. unfortunately, despite the fact he was on the internet five years before that, it wasn't until he took the abrasive position that you start getting clicks and you start getting views and you start getting this. So do we blame the restaurant or the appetite? Do we blame the supplier or the demand? Hmm. Right? So I think there are two conversations. Like if I met him, I can't really say stop doing what you're doing because he's just talking. Mm -hmm. But if he's actually doing the substantive work that he talks about doing, then, hey, I understand. It's unfortunate we have to go this route, but I get it. 
I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I, I wish I did. But, um, yeah, I think we need to look at ourselves and, and yeah. question why we force people to have to do the clown bullshit to actually get some traction. Now, what, just so I'm clear, what did mm -hmm. you see or what did you hear that Charleston White said about Deion Sanders? I want to know if we're talking about the same thing. Uh, didn't he say he hope he lose? He hope his son get hurt. He hope all, he, he put he out all kinds of twenty thousand. He said, mm. "I I will be willing to give somebody twenty thousand mm. dollars to hurt Deion Sanders' son." Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is the intellectual. But again, like I said, um, this I is think, cosplay. Well, I but that's what I'm saying. I I think. People like Charleston White spark three different conversations. I think mm -hmm. they spark the conversation of the supply and demand. I think that's worth a conversation. I think they spark the conversation of um, should we be so easily moved by rhetoric, by words? I think that's a conversation. Yeah. And I think the last conversation is what it looks like versus what it is. So again, because I don't know him personally, um, for, for instance, there was one time he was talking about some of the work that he does with kids. And he said that um, part of the reason he wanted to go to prison when he was a kid is because he saw that only the uh, gangsters who came home were celebrated. The college kids weren't celebrated when they came home. Yeah. You know, he talked about part of the reason why he was so belligerent and bad as a kid is because he wanted some of those male authority figures to go home with him. He wanted a daddy. Right. So for for him to to have the ability to on the ground level articulate some of those nuanced feelings that boys are having. Now, he has to do all the theatrics to be relevant. That's powerful. Again, yeah. if it is leading to actual like if he's actually speaking at the prisons and actually working with boys and actually doing rehabilitation programs and all that he's saying, then we have to look at. Why are black folks so triggered by words? You could move them this way by saying this, move them this way by saying that, because that might be the larger uh, indictment that he's trying to levy on our community. Mm -hmm. But again, it could all be bullshit. I don't know. But I just think they're those three mm -hmm. conversations we should be willing to have as a community. Yeah. I was talking to, I got a homeboy to play for the Raiders. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him about, you're doing this with you. No, he, he's a fan of yours. Hey. hey. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was like, you know, Deion Sanders, actually, um, the money that they are giving him, I think he's, it was like, like five million or something. Mm. He was like, um, he underbidded himself as far as his contract. Facts, 100%. He was like, I mean, he, Merchandise went up 800% since he's yep. been there. 800%, yeah. 800%. Mm -hmm. um, his glasses. Mm -hmm. First three days pre-sold, uh, to 5 million glasses by itself pre-sold within three days. So does Deion Sanders know his worth? Or... <laughs> Or mm -hmm. have we grown accustomed to a paradigm where black men have to overachieve mm. to be appreciated? Yeah, you do. You do. That's the question. Have we grown accustomed to you have to go above and be yeah. despite what you deserve, whether it's with women, mm -hmm. whether it's with universities or whatever the case may be, you have to go above and beyond. Because there, there's some, there's some um, head coaches right now that their job before that was being an assistant coach. Mm -hmm. Did they play past college? No. But Deion Sanders, despite his resume as a player, despite what he did at Jackson State, despite what he did at, at, at high school, he's still an unexperienced coach. Mm -hmm. Now, white folks are clear on why that is, because ultimately they don't see you can never be good enough as a black man. Right. Outside of fucking good and running fast and being strong. Now, are we willing to see ourselves in a lens outside of that? 
Because they taught us how to see ourselves too. Yeah. So that's why, you know, I get so upset and disappointed when we are the loudest voices in those critiques. Because again, I expect them to say, grown folks take their glasses off and their hat. I don't expect us to say that. I expect them to say, you didn't finish out your contract, you don't finish anything. I didn't expect us to say that. We were supposed to see the big picture. We were, we were supposed to see what he, he was up against. We were, were supposed to see the fact that he's underbidding himself with Colorado. What the hell was he doing at Jackson State? Sacrificing. <laughs> he was sacrificing. <sighs> I just want to see more Deion Sanders, and I know that it's not going to work if we keep running them off. Mm. If, 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 you know... Like we need to be able to, we need to be able to look Deion Sanders in the face and say that. And this is what I thought HBCUs did to students, because yeah. I, I spent the summer at Morehouse. We need to be able to look them in the face and say that we don't have the best facilities. You know, you could probably go to a, a, a better, more a better, more known school. You know, better equipment in the whole nine. But guess what? they will not be able to treat you half as good as we will. So despite our deficiencies, we will fight tooth and nail to get you whatever you need and make sure that you know your worth. Now, we're not, we tend to take the posture of, I'm doing you a favor. Good man, I'm doing you. You should be glad that you get to deal with my 20 years of trauma and baggage. You should be happy that I'm giving you this, this used vagina and, and all, 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 all the issues that now you have to deal with and fixing my, my credit. and fit. You should be happy because I'm a great woman. As opposed to saying that despite my flaws that are clear and apparent, it's not a secret, nobody's going to go as hard for you as I am. Mm-hmm. Because that moves, that moves away from entitlement. <laughs> that moves away from entitlement to, all right, let's make a deal. Because we, we do that with corporate America. Yeah. I know I don't check off all the boxes on your job description. I yeah. know that there's some candidates with master's degrees and doctor degrees. But guess what? If I don't know the answer to a question, I'm going to find out in 24 hours. There you go. We understand how to do that there. But like for us, because we don't see value in ourselves... We don't think it's even worth that conversation. Nigga, you should, be, you should want to be over here. Mm-hmm. You see our band? Their band ain't like our band. That was, <laughs> we didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's, 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 that's my thing. Whether, because even like uh, with this channel, that's a question that I get a lot. You know, mm-hmm. since I'm not a fan of Passport Bros or SYSBM. Some brothers asked me the fair question, like, do you expect black men to just settle for single mothers? Do you expect black men to tolerate bad behavior? Do you expect black men to just sign up for being cursed out and the whole nine or trauma dumped on? And I have to articulate that, number one, no. I expect Mm -hmm. you to do the work so you can find those gems of black women that are are out there and exist. Um, But number two, I want you to be able to see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. I want you to be able to see that Fortunately or, 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 or unfortunately, as black people, what you do matters to me, mm-hmm. especially in the context of this country. Maybe once it's Wakanda, you could do your own thing. It don't matter. But in the context of this country, you could fuck up my property value, proverbial property value. Mm-hmm. Right. And we need to care on that level, not just the spiritual airy fairy hoity toity shit that we usually talk about. Yeah. I hear you, Alan. You got me on my soap. You, you, you know? I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, hey. you got me on my soapbox. So what? Hey. What are your? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I well, I was gonna say, you know, we could have had this conversation, uh, a long last time year. Ago. This right. this was last year, wasn't it? Was it last year? When he, when did he leave Jackson? I guess so. Maybe one. Like, yeah, because spring, like, yeah, they. Sp- no, no, no. It was earlier this year because um, he left Jackson after the championship to come to um, like announce to the players that they were gonna switch stuff up. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think I think it was earlier this year. But um, 
you so what, what, what are your final thoughts? Uh, you ain't going to make me do a three-hour stream. I told the people I'm not doing that anymore. So what are your final thoughts so we can close <laughs> you told the people. this thing on that? Well, I mean, we talked about a lot. Um, but as far as like with Deion Sanders, um, mm -hmm. you know, my, my hurt has healed. Yeah. And, you know, I do see the bigger picture. And I support Deion Sanders. I hope he is 11 to 12 and old. And I think that he needs, he needs to be protected. 100%. And his sons, for sure. Um, no, he needs to be protected. I am very proud of him. Mm -hmm. I really am. So. To to further speak to his character, you know, uh, his second son Shiloh mm -hmm. didn't actually want to leave Jackson. Mm -hmm. Shiloh Shiloh was actually going to stay back. Yeah, and he was going to ride out with the HBCUs and the whole nine. Um, but things were so bad that he ended up transferring. So again, we can continue to single out these people who refuse to be martyrs because. I don't want to fucking kill myself. Martin Luther King also said, I have no martyrdom syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, we never talk about that aspect of him. He literally gave a speech, said, I want to live a long time. <laughs> but we only focus on the I have a I dream have and the fact that he ended up dying in the line of duty. But like, we cannot expect superhumanness from black men. Mm. We're human and we're looking for peace. We're looking for tranquility. We're looking for sustainability. We're looking for deals that make sense, not just for us or, or, or the, the person or the institution that we're giving ourselves to, but generally. So if we want black men to be on the front lines, we want black men, how are we rewarding that behavior? Whether mm -hmm. it's women or whether it's black institutions. And I think we need to be able to zoom out enough to have those conversations because for us to just continue to lambast and beat down black men, oh, you won a Super Bowl, you didn't win two Super Bowls. Mm -hmm. you, you got the straight A's, you didn't get Dean's list. Like, at some point, niggas just gonna check out. And we're seeing it happen with Gen Z. Yeah. These kids are watching how, like, it's all bullshit. You're never gonna be good enough, so why try? Mm. You know, so if we want to reverse these things, we need to save our critiques for our institutions. We need to save our critiques for, for our groups, right? And, and not be so individualistic in our analysis.